double uh, act presentation on the role of zero trust and zero trust architectures in digital transformation. Our two presenters, Mark Simos is the lead architect for Microsoft Cybersecurity Solutions Group, where he's part of a group of cybersecurity experts, former CISOs and former regulators, who provide advice and guidance on cybersecurity strategy and technology. With Mark, um, we have Altaz Valani, who is Director of Research at Security Compass, where he manages the overall research vision and the team. Altaz is a regular conference speaker who conducts uh, ongoing research in the software security domain. Prior to joining Security Compass, he was Senior Research Director and Executive Advisor at Infotech Research Group, Senior Manager at KPMG, as well as various positions working alongside senior stakeholders to drive business value through software development. And I'm not sure if we have both of you gentlemen yet, but um, I'm going to hand over to, to uh, Altaz, I think is definitely with us. Um, so a warm welcome from the open group to uh, Mark Simos and Altaz Valani. Over to you. All right, thank you very much. Should Mark join us? Uh, not a problem. We will certainly um, get him to speak to his slides as well. Thank you for doing double duty. So. Sure, not a problem. It's a pleasure. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, everybody, for attending the session today on Zero Trust. What we're going to do is really look at three stages to our presentation today. We will start with an introduction where we will walk through the context uh, in, in, in looking at where zero trust and digital first intersect. And then we'll walk through a case study. We wanted to keep this presentation very practical. And so we'll walk through the stages that an organization would, would go through uh, starting with a leadership offsite meeting, uh, followed by security planning, an initial business case being built for zero trust, followed by a current and future state analysis, IT capabilities to achieve secure digital, and then transformation using zero trust. And finally, from a case study perspective, how an organization might uh, uh, receive a call to action. And finally, we're going to conclude with a involved, uh, please feel free to join us at the security forum in the open group. I uh, would be happy to have your participation in there. Uh, so once again, the, the presentation is really intended to be uh, a walkthrough in a very practical way of how uh, an organization might uh, go about building the zero trust. Uh, I won't spend time going through the bio data. Uh, we've already heard that, I think. Uh, so looking at, at where we are today in terms of our context, uh, we really are facing a situation today where we have evolving business models. And when we talk about evolving business models, it's uh, really around looking for opportunities where there are, um, where the landscape is affording uh, new uh, creative opportunities to provide value to end customers or to businesses. Uh, in so doing, we have emerging partnerships as well. And some of these partnerships, for example, involve working with competitors. And we also have rapidly changing technology where we have cloud microservices. Uh, a lot of these emerging technologies, serverless, are, are, are shifting us uh, towards this direction when we're looking at, at how things can become more and more digital. We also have regulatory, geopolitical, and cultural forces at play. Um, and this we heard earlier was uh, is related to things like not just security, but privacy and legal, and even looking at things around ethical foundations as well. Uh, but for the purposes of this presentation, we will take a look at what this means from a security perspective as we explore zero trust and, and, and looking at that angle. There are a lot of disruptive events happening. Uh, we know, for example, uh, when we take a look at uh, what we're doing with uh, what, what, what's happening with COVID, for example, um, that's one example. But there are many other such examples where we've got to explore risk. And so we want to be able to enable the business from a security perspective, but also at the same time, help them manage the risk and the paradigm shift to remote work. What used to be inside the perimeter, as we heard earlier, um, you know, is, is no longer a, uh, the only way to do things. It's, it's the, the, the paradigm has shifted. We're, we've got a lot of people working on the outside now. Uh, and so we need to rethink uh, this perimeter based model of security and consider how we might use zero trust. So what we've done at the open group here 
is we've come up with a definition of zero trust as an overarching cybersecurity paradigm uh, to help address the, the concerns uh, that, that I talked about earlier. Uh, and really what we're looking at is the ability to operate on any network uh, and, and even that, that includes public or untrusted or zero trust networks in essence. And this is what we're trying to achieve. How do we continue to help the business move forward in this kind of paradigm given the confluence of events that we're witnessing? So getting into the case study itself, what we'll do is walk through a story. Uh, initially, we have a CEO and the CEO wants to engage in digital transformation. So the goal here is how do we grow revenue and contain our risk within three uh, parameters? Uh, number one, the remote workforce. Number two, we want to look at cloud adoption. And number three, we have this continually evolving supply chain. What is part of our supply chain today may not be a part of a supply chain tomorrow. We may have contractors today, no contractors tomorrow. We may be work competitors today. We may decide to, to uh, end that at some point. Uh, and so we have this executive team that gets together and decides that we want to now go forward and enable this particular strategy. <clears throat> so as part of this discussion, the CISO and the chief risk officer uh, give some high level uh, understanding of our current and future state. Uh, we currently are using a network security paradigm, which isn't scaling and will not really enable us to get where we need to go. In terms of the future state, we want to move to a data-centric model where we're bringing security to the data, to the assets, to the applications themselves. And as a result of that, we want to adopt zero trust. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that this is going to be a journey. It's incremental delivery that we're looking at. So while we are on a digital first journey, we also want to make sure that as we deliver each of these uh, 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 plateaus that we're looking at when we implement uh, uh, each of these uh, elements of the journey itself, um, that we are incrementally delivering this value over time. So as we plan this digital transformation, uh, we want to focus specifically on security. So now that the offsite is done, we have the CISO, the chief risk officer, and the CIO taking a step back. They go, they hold their meeting now, and they start to talk about what it means from a digital transformation perspective with the lens of security. So step one of this process is they go through this discovery of the current state of the security toolkit. What do we have today? It could be a combination of firewalls. We may have, from an application standpoint, we might be doing things like threat modeling. We might be th doing things like code scanning, penetration testing, um, and looking as well at other things that we put around uh, our, our, our infrastructure and our applications in order to uh, maintain the level of security that we're looking for. But this is all about the current state of where we are today. The next step is to develop an incremental zero trust roadmap. So when they have this discussion, the goal is where do we need to go? And what are the deliverables that we want to have that will get us there without going too far and giving us enough leeway where we can incrementally go in and make these deliverables from a zero trust perspective? The third step is to determine the scope of the application rationalization for zero trust. So normally when we talk about APRAT, you want to make sure that you're rationalizing for a particular endpoint. In this case, we would be rationalizing for zero trust. So looking at the current suite of applications and trying to determine uh, which applications do we need to retire, which applications should we upgrade, what do we need to integrate, things like that. And so this is all about making sure that when we rationalize the applications against the life cycle that we've got of each of these applications, the goal is to, uh, within the portfolio of applications that we have that it is continually providing business value. And the fourth step is identifying the right metrics and the OKRs to align with business risk. Um, and the goal here, of course, is when we talk about incremental delivery, uh, OKRs are uh, a great way of going in there and aligning uh, the results with the objectives that have been set uh, by uh, the, the higher level executive team within the organization. And 
by identifying the correct metrics, we are now able to incrementally measure what we are going to do in order to deliver against that roadmap for zero trust. So these are the, the sort of the steps that we would go through in helping us to consider how security can play a role as we intersect zero trust with the digital transformation. So as you can see, the goal is always to uh, make sure that we're enabling the business, but at the same time, we also wanna make sure that we are managing the risk. Uh, and if anything comes up, we're able to articulate that in a way that makes sense uh, from, from a business standpoint. So failure and success uh, really is determined by four things, four key things. Uh, there's the business agility and the ability to move quickly while managing risk. I, I spoke about that earlier. Um, and we also want to be able to enable this remote workforce and the ability to move forward with a cloud migration strategy, which is where we are uh, when we talk about a digital transformation. We have to deal with an increasingly complex and dynamic environment. Uh, so as we move forward, uh, we take a look at microservices, for example. What does that mean uh, when we when we measure this from a success standpoint? Uh, going back to the points that we had mentioned earlier, um, how do we rationalize? How do we go in there and gradually ease the current application portfolio into something that would allow us to gain greater agility? And measure this with OKRs. Uh, so each of these four areas will help us to drive success of this initiative. And on the right-hand side at the bottom here, it is really driving towards an MVP roadmap. And we want to ensure that we've got uh, four key perspectives that we always have in mind as we consider this roadmap. Certainly security, as we take a look at where zero trust can play a role in enabling the future state of the organization around digital first but also taking a look at, at operations, um, taking a look at the financial side of it. Uh, how do we determine uh, the effect of ROI as we go through each incremental stage of getting us to that final state and taking a look at our systems as well. So from a systems perspective, really exploring uh, what do we need to do uh, that we might perhaps need to add in addition to what we have at this point. So this overall, this chart here, really gives us uh, an overview of the steps that the CISO, the CRO, and the CIO would walk through and to, to come up with ultimately an MVP roadmap to help us incrementally deliver. So looking at the CISO now, the CISO takes this back and the CISO works through what are the things that I need to consider in order, in order to build a strong business case for zero trust. So we've got, at the very beginning, there was the executive decision that we're going to move forward with digital transformation. We had a high level roadmap. We had a separate executive team that, that stepped apart and, and started to take a look and, and determine what are some of the big areas that we, went with that we need to take a look at from a program standpoint. And then the CISO now looks at it from a zero trust perspective, specifically to defend why zero trust might be able to help the organization move forward. So. The first thing is that zero trust will help digital transformation because we're looking to operate in a world now without trust. Uh, the perimeter-based defense mechanisms that we had in the past are no longer scaling. Uh, we wanna take actions today to ensure that we're protected tomorrow. So it is a forward-looking business enabling paradigm where security is uh, at the forefront, is at the executive table, providing insight and input into uh, what can be done to ensure that the business can move forward with confidence. The second is around the architecture, which will allow the business to both operate and to grow. And this is really about avoiding the risks and the threats, uh, you know, and, and, and really looking at this proactively rather than reactive mitigations where we find that something went wrong and now we have to step in and we've got to try and fix that. And usually that, that adds a lot of pressure and uh, slows down the business. So the intent here is to keep the business moving at the pace that, the, that is expected, but doing it in a way that, that provides the security assurance that this is going to be okay. We also are looking at reducing the threat surface area. By looking at zero trust and bringing security to the assets themselves, rather than creating a fence and bringing the assets into that paradigm, we're really kind of looking at the other side of the coin. 
And by doing that, we're able to go now and bring security uh, at a much more granular level. Uh, it also allows us to work within an untrusted partner security model. And so by looking at the policies that we can create, uh, we are able to go in now and to integrate within a partner ecosystem, uh, which can be quite difficult to do if you think about uh, creating uh, a, a universal policy uh, within a perimeter-based model as you try and, and, and bring partners in uh, and then partners leave. And so you've got to sort of figure out how you're going to manage that. Uh, it also allows the rapid integration and decoupling of both inter- and intra-organizational boundaries. Uh, so we uh, oftentimes hear today about things like uh, enclaves. We hear about how we could go in and we can provide, even within the organization, certain boundaries and provide um, uh, just uh, controlled access to given assets, and then extending this and going really between organizations now as well. So this is what zero trust would enable. And, and, and this is part of the business case that gets built in by the CISO. Uh, really looking at this as a proactive approach, which uh, will allow security to bring risk management, uh, it, which really avoids a lengthy compliance engagement, which is typically done uh, where everything comes to a standstill and you've got to figure out, are we in compliance, are we not? Uh, but if you go in and you reduce the, 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 the surface area that you're considering, you can now go in there and start to create policies uh, that are much more fine grained. Uh, and so we uh, are able to go in and we're able to, to achieve uh, the level of, of, of compliance um, and in so doing, roll up into risk assessments and risk management that provide the business with the assurance that we are, in fact, not in breach, but we are in compliance as we go through. All within a digital paradigm, all within agile, DevOps, continuous delivery. And finally, uh, better understand and quantify the risk. Uh, so this model is compatible with OpenFAIR, uh, which is a proven and industry reputed approach. Uh, looking at ways to extract data that we can use. And by looking at the telemetry into the zero trust assets, we're able to extract out information that is related to uh, security, which we can then roll up within FAIR to provide us um, uh, a, a better guidance and, and information uh, more accurate uh, as it relates to, to risk and the risk assessment process. We also have the enterprise architects now that get involved, and the enterprise architects will help us identify the current and the future state. And really looking at where we are today, looking at the current risk approaches, uh, largely based on mitigation. Uh, it's uh, uh, looking at uh, trying to go and shift towards this threat surface reduction model uh, and really not around uh, proactive uh, avoidance, uh, really where we're, where we're moving forward and trying to get on side with where the business wants to go. So moving away from a uh, reactive to a more proactive, but as of today, we tend to be largely reactive. Uh, and, and making sure that we enable the business by uh, coming back with a response that says, yes, we can assist you with that rather than looking at ways to block the business from moving forward uh, because we need to try and force it into, into a given uh, paradigm of security around some perimeter or, or something like that. So in the future, what we want to do is we want to consider how we can solve, how we can enable the business, not why we can't do that, try to look at ways to quantify the reduction of loss and, and try to move towards being more proactive. Uh, shifting the paradigm from network centricity to data or asset centricity. Uh, and if something comes up, then we know that, that we're able to go in there and provide uh, evidence as to why the approach is going to be able to help us uh, because we are able to, to go in and set policies at a much more granular level. Uh, and this is driven by policies. So the goal here for the enterprise architects in this model as we walk through this case study would be to go and to take a look at the current state and the future state and to determine now what are some of the things that we need to do in order to bridge these gaps, uh, which rolls back to what the CISO was looking at from uh, his or her perspective, 
around how we can enable the business and taking a look at the security tools and the application rationalization. That was the discussion that happened before, which ultimately then also rolls up to the executive decision on moving forward with digital first. So the CIO uh, looks at this and then identifies what are the IT capabilities that we would need to go in and enable this. Uh, and uh, within, um, within the security forum, we've identified these particular IT capabilities, starting with the data centricity, uh, looking at how we can go in and enable this uh, from a people, process, and technology perspective so that we can uh, afford and provide the necessary level of granularity from a security perspective. We have threat scope reduction and risk avoidance, looking at once again at both enabling the business but also helping them to manage the risk. Uh, looking at secured zones, uh, from a secure zone perspective, it's uh, ensuring that we've got the right people accessing the right assets at the right time on the right devices. Uh, and this is all being driven by policy-driven access control. And then we've got the ability to automate the auditing capabilities, so everything that goes along with that. What are the reporting structures that we would need? What are the integrations that we would need to enable this? Um, how are we going to be able to go and translate the business level uh, metrics into something that we've got our, our development teams and operational teams would be executing against? And doing all of this in real time or near real time response. In a digital first model, uh, we want to make sure that we're moving as quickly as possible and that we are in fact transferring information digitally uh, while at the same time providing the necessary assurance uh, across all of these assets that we are now protecting. So the call to action would then be from the perspective of zero trust to identify what's the scope uh, in terms of time, the cost, the resources. And this is where the incremental delivery would come into play. What do we have time for as a phase one? What is it going to cost us and who needs to be involved with that? Second would be to identify the funding in order to implement zero trust. Uh, what is uh, what is it going to take to go in and rationalize our applications? Are we going to need to include uh, something new into our ecosystem that wasn't there before? Uh, and looking at funding and measuring that against the business value that would be provided against zero trust. Uh, the third would be aligning our objectives and our key results and making sure that we are really making sure that we're we're enabling where the business is headed uh, with the remote workforce uh, with the idea that we want to go in there and look at our our supply chain and seeing how we might be able to enable a rapidly evolving ecosystem around that and finally assigning accountabilities and dates for execution from a delivery standpoint so incremental delivery making sure we've got the right accountabilities, we've got the right OKRs, we've got the right funding in place, and we know what the scope is. And each of these would then tie into uh, where the CISO, the CIO, the chief risk officer would go in and contribute towards this to help us then make a business case and uh, a roadmap for the executive team. In the end, uh, I would uh, just, as we exit uh, from, the, uh, from the case study now, I uh, just wanted to also let everybody know that as part of Zero Trust, uh, we would like to have lots of people get involved and to make a difference in what we are doing. Uh, we've got a Zero Trust uh, link there. You're welcome to come participate at the open group. Uh, we also have uh, a security forum where you can participate in other projects as well. We have a survey that is right now uh, going to be coming out. We've done one survey. We have another one that's going to be coming out soon. Watch the Open Group blog and email. Uh, please do participate in that. We also have a LinkedIn group. Uh, so at the end, I would invite everybody, please come in, participate, and uh, let's help to evolve Zero Trust uh, moving forward. And with that, I would like to open it up uh, if there are any questions from anybody. Thank you, Altaz. Um, wonderful, uh, wonderful walk through there, um, and nice. Uh, you, you said it was going to be practical, and it was. Uh, it was a set of practical steps, and, uh, and very uh, understandable and uh, and useful. So, thank you for that. And again, thank you for um, for covering for Mark as well. Um, we do, we do think we've made contact with him, but uh, but you've uh, you've uh, gone through it all by yourself now. So, 
Um, a few few things coming in congratulating you on the presentation. So uh, so thank you for that. Thank um, you. A, a, a question um, that that's come up: D Do you see that um, zero trust is is inevitable as a as a direction for uh, as an approach for security in the world of digital transformation that we're all in now? Yeah, we do. Uh, we saw this as a journey, and the current pandemic has, in fact, accelerated this. Um, as we go forward with uh, digital first, and, and that being the mandate in many organizations across many different industries, um, how are you going to be agile and nimble? Right, we've got to extend what we have been doing right now around a perimeter-based model to start to control the individual assets as well. And so zero trust fits very nicely into that kind of a paradigm. Um, and, and so as we continue to explore this and as we partner with others in the industry and other working groups as well, um, we're finding that this is the approach that lends itself very well to a digital first mandate. Right, and I think we're, we're going to hear later in our um, in our session today about uh, some of the digital standard activities that are going on in the open movement. And this is great because it's it's kind of pervasive. I mean, security needs to be and needs to be part of everything. And um, and it's great that we've got that activity going on there. And uh, I second your call to action. Um, you know, we we need uh, we we have some great minds already working on this inside the open group, but uh, we'd love to have more. And uh, there's there's lots to be done, but um, in the interest of time, out as we're going to uh, move on. But uh, thank you once again. Warm uh, virtual round of applause for Altas Villani. Thank you. Thank you.